So as I said, we're going to continue our insect world tour today with uh, my favorite insect, the firefly. And we'll also talk about uh, the other kind of rulers of our summer nights, uh, moths, which we sort of have to see in our mind's eye since they're not as conspicuous as the beautiful fireflies. So the firefly actually interestingly became our state insect in 1974. And that was voted on by a school in Upper Darby. They contacted the governor. They said, hey, Maryland has a state insect. Why don't we have ours? <laughs> and so that's when we became, uh, the state insect became the firefly. And it's an appropriate uh, insect. It's uh, one of our most uh, charismatic mini fauna, one of our most charismatic insects. Um, this is a quote from Sarah Lewis, who wrote a book on fireflies. Uh, fireflies might just be the most, the best loved insects on earth, time and again, magically rekindling our sense of wonder. And they really do sort of evoke those childhood memories of running through fields on summer evenings, and they just have the ability to transform an otherwise ordinary landscape. So it's a celebrated insect all over the world. Uh, Malaysia, they get 80,000 tourists a year to see their uh, firefly light shows. In Taiwan, they also have thousands of tourists. And in uh, Jap Japan, they also have fireflies. And they, they've really been revered in Japanese culture, country, and art for uh, centuries. They believe that um, sacred spirits manifest themselves throughout the natural world and things like fireflies. So sacred meeting. We have some really amazing fireflies in the Great Smoky Mountains, quite a show in uh, the little town of Elkmont, Tennessee. This was revealed to the scientific community pretty uh, recently, not until 1993. Until then, it was believed that these what they're called synchronous fireflies were only in Asia. And then we realized we had some species, some uh, pockets here in America, right in Tennessee. So these, this is a species of firefly where the males form leks, staging leks, sort of like birds, the, that term is L-E-K-S. And they all perform uh, simultaneously. They all light up simultaneously uh, for the females who are perched and watching the light show. And this became quite a tourist attraction. And now every year you can, uh, only two weeks, it's a two week window in June that you can see these, this incredible uh, light show. Uh, they've got buses that take you there into this little um, forest area. And I think they have something like 30,000 tourists each year. And I actually, of course it's different now with COVID. Now they're doing it just as a lottery. <laughs> so I tried, I entered the lottery earlier this spring and I didn't make it but apparently you have to win the lottery ticket now to be able to um, get on one of these one of these tour buses. So therefore it's still on my bucket list, but it's it seems really incredible. Uh, so fireflies are not flies at all, but they're actually beetles. Uh, beetles are the order Coleoptera and it's actually uh, comprises a quarter of all the animal species on earth, a quarter of all living things animals are beetles, uh, 400,000 beetle species. They're all, what makes them a beetle is that they are sheath winged. So they really almost have like four, four wings. The uh, front wings are hard coverings to protect the delicate hind wings. And that's essentially what makes a beetle a beetle. And uh, fireflies in particular are in the family Lampyridae. And so these are the beetles that have uh, these four characteristic, characteristics in common. They all have bioluminescence. Bio is Greek for living and lumen is Latin for light. So it literally means living light. Uh, all of the Lampyridae family are also squishy, sort of squishy bodied, but they have a shield on their head, which you can see on that top right corner 
the fireflies can actually are almost like turtles. They can kind of hide their head underneath that, that shield that's sort of on their neck area. And then they also all have a common ancestor from 26 million years ago in the Jurassic period. So they know this from the fossil record. They found a couple uh, firefly lovers uh, in, embalmed, entombed in amber, uh, mating, mating forever. <laughs> so, uh, but in the Jurassic world, they may not have been, uh, they may have only had uh, lanterns that light as larva and not as the adult form that was flying around. So, so dinosaurs may not have had the, the firefly night show that we have now. So firefly species, there's 2000 in the world, 2000 of these beetles in the family Lampyridae. They're found on every continent except for Antarctica, because of course it's too cold. And there are, so there's about 120 species in North America. And then just like many other organisms, there's more species as you move closer to the equator. So there's about 350 in Brazil. And in America, there, uh, there's more species in like the Georgia region and with only one in Alaska. So there's three main firefly types. So we all know, we're all familiar with the lightning bug, the most common that lights up the summer nights. And then there's the glow worm. And that's more of a Northern European uh, firefly type. So the glow worm uh, is in the lower, the bottom picture there of the big one with that greenish glow, that's a glow worm. And that, those are a little different in that the females uh, sit perched and instead of doing the quick flash that we know of with our lightning bugs, uh, the female just sits and does kind of a long, she just kind of holds her lantern on, waiting for tiny unlit males uh, to come by. So that's a glowworm. And you might hear people talk about glowworms here in North America, and they're referring to the larval stage of our lightning bug, because then they look more like worms, glowworms. Uh, and then we have the dark fireflies, and that's on the upper right. So these are the fireflies that don't light up at all, and therefore they fly around during the day and use windborne perfumes for communication. So three firefly types. Uh, we have the common eastern firefly, which the Latin is Photinus pyrilis, and this is the Big Dipper firefly. This is the one we know of that makes the J, they, they sky write the letter J at dusk. So this is probably our most well-known of the firefly species around here. And they, they like grassy, sort of grassy areas where they come out at dusk, the males come out at dusk and make that J shape and the females uh, respond. So fireflies, this sort of lightning bug firefly are only found east of the Rockies. Here's a map. All the green spots are where you can see fireflies. And they're really spotty west of the Rockies. Uh, they're, they're really only found in certain, certain pockets. And they actually, in the 1950s, tried to introduce uh, a firefly species in some of the parks of Seattle and, uh, and Portland. And they didn't take for whatever reason. So they don't have fireflies over there. So we're lucky, lucky to have these beautiful insects. So how do they do it? It's a complex chemical reaction, which I don't have a physical background to tell you about totally, but essentially it's uh, an enzyme called luciferase. And that binds oxygen and the compound luciferin together to create that yellow amber glow. And they bring in, so oxygen, they actually draw that in through their abdomen and to initiate this, this light, this chemical reaction that produces light. And it's just, it, it's just a cold light. It doesn't produce any heat. So they call it a, a cold light. And they can control the amount of air that flot, that they draw in to the abdomen to control the pulse rate and the flash and all of that. So they have complete control 
over their light. So fireflies do complete metamorphosis, like every bee, butterfly, ant, moth, fly, half of the animals in the world do a complete metamorphosis, uh, mostly insects. And they do this because it allows for the adult and the juvenile to occupy totally different habitats and use completely different resources to, so that we're minimizing competition. So it's a very, uh, very successful uh, life strategy. So for fireflies, they need moist areas. So in moths or wet soil uh, to lay their eggs. The female lays the eggs in uh, late June, maybe July, depending on where you are in latitude. They lay the eggs. The eggs hatch within a couple weeks into larva, which is the next little life form you see in the middle of this. These images here looks like a little glow worm, as we said uh, before. And then the, the larval stage is really the, the longest part of firefly's life. This can last anywhere from a year to three years. And they, they eat under, well, ours eat underground or subterranean larva, and they can uh, hibernate in the winter when it gets cold and then just keep munching, 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 eating, shedding your skin, growing uh, for a couple of years until they're ready to pupate. And on the right, you see the pupa of the fireflies. And that is just a couple of weeks. And then the pupa emerge as our flighted adult firefly. So a lot of people don't realize that the, when you see the adult firefly flying around in the summer, it's really the very last, you're just seeing a tiny bit of its life, just a, really a few weeks. And most of its life was, was private underground. Now the North American glowworms, those larvae spend a lot of time above ground. And so they're more studied than our firefly larva. So that's, this picture is of a, a, North, um, a European glowworm. Uh, and they're pretty fierce predators. So they, so this is a picture of a larva injecting a snail with digestive and uh, with first um, paralysis enzymes, chemicals, and then digestive enzymes. So it's literally paralyzing its prey and then turning the insides into soup, which it slurps up. <laughs> so, so they eat snails, uh, they eat earthworms, and they eat other soft-bodied insects. And the larval, uh, the larvas also have, larva and the pupa also have those lights, so they, when you touch them and disturb them, they light up a little more. Uh, and you might ask why, what's the purpose of a, of a larval light? And the answer is that they, because they have such a long childhood and are susceptible to predation, uh, evolution gave them this light, which is essentially a warning sign. So they are educating predators that, hey, I'm toxic, don't eat me. That's what the light does. And because they're underground in dark environments, a bright color like, you know, monarch butterflies are bright orange and black to warn predators, but uh, coloration doesn't really work if you're in the dark. So thus the lights as a warning sign. And so it wasn't until millions of years later in the evolution of fireflies that the adults adopted the lantern for courtship. And it really brought the courtship of fireflies to the next level. Uh, does somebody, uh, let me see. Uh, somebody may need to mute uh, their, their screen there. Let's just make sure everybody's, take a minute to make sure you're muted, please. Um, so this is a little diagram of all the different, not all the different, because we have about 35 different species of, of the, genus Photinus in North America. It's the smaller firefly, a common firefly that we're, uh, we're all familiar with. There's about 35 different species. Some of them look the exact same. There's no way to tell them apart except for their distinctive flash pattern. So this is a chart of different, blue ghost is a really interesting one. I think that's also in um, sort of that Elkmont, Tennessee region, but they just have this creepy little blue light that just stays on and they fly really low close to the ground. And so that's how they got the name Blue Ghost. 
And then there's all these other, so there, the synchronous Photinus carolinus is the synchronous firefly we mentioned before. They have six flashes on and then this long pause and they all do the six flashes on. And then there at the very bottom is our J Skywriter, the Big Dipper Firefly that we mentioned before. So all different flight paths and flash patterns. And so this is the male. So very much like uh, when we talked about birds earlier in this course, it's generally the, the male birds that sing. Uh, same with the fireflies. This is just sort of a quiet song. So the males are doing this light show uh, because essentially because uh, eggs are more expensive than sperm. So the female is perched on a bar stool or her little blade of grass. And she's just watching the show and looking at the male and responding to one that she finds attractive. And she's not going to waste her energy. So all the energy for this flight, this male flight and uh, light display comes from that larval feasting. They don't eat as adults. So all the energy is just that's why they only live a few few weeks. They, they essentially eventually run out of energy. So she is, the timing is everything for this. So she can learn what species is her own by the, the duration of dark between the lights, the exact timing, the seconds in between the flashes. And then when she sees a male that she likes, she aims her lantern at him and flashes back. And even her flash response has to be perfectly timed so that he knows that she is his species. And then he goes to her and finds her in the dark and they meet. So as I said, timing is everything. The stakes are high. So uh, the females take a little longer for metamorphosis than the males. So the males emerge first in June. And that you have a lot more males than females. So you have a male biased sex ratio. So with all, so there may be, for example, may, for every 12 females, there may be 200 males. So she can afford to be very choosy in a situation like this. So, and she has, she has some preferences just like birds. So birds listening to the male song, she's detecting many things about the male song, like is how healthy he is, his fitness, how old he is. And she's the female firefly is really doing that with uh, his light. So she's detecting these within species, each male has subtle differences in the flash duration and the pulse rate. So she's detecting those differences. And they discovered, scientists discovered that female fireflies like either a fast pulse rate or a long pulse duration. And both of these things make the male more uh, conspicuous. So the females are picking the males that are, are putting the most at risk. Maybe they're the healthiest that are avoiding predators the best. So unfortunately, out of every, out of 199 male fireflies, only about two of those will find, will survive. Uh, to find females within that three week window of life that they have. Unfortunately, everything likes to eat the fireflies, um, mostly spiders and assassin bugs. So orb weavers and wolf spiders and even harvest men, which uh, those are like, those are the daddy long legs. They're not technically spiders. So everything will eat fireflies. They'll catch them in their webs and eat them. The only, the only spider that won't eat fireflies that's a little more discerning is a jumping, the jumping spider for whatever reason. Uh, so many, many fireflies uh, die in the, the courtship display. So then towards the end of the season, you have a female bias ratio. So now you have more females than males. And that this is the time when she gets desperate and you can go out at this time with, if you have a pen light, you can actually shine it and flash it um, at around in the dark and, and you'll see, you can kind of talk to, talk to the fireflies at this point. She'll, she'll respond to anything that flashes at this point because now she's desperate. Now she's desperate girl in the bar. <laughs> so um, and so that now the males can afford to be choosy at this point because the females outnumber them. And so the males will actually choose the, what they think may be the healthier females. And they judge this by her girth. 
So he will actually fly to her and wrap his arms, his legs around her to judge her width. And if she's too skinny, he'll move on. <laughs> so. And then last but not least, we've got uh, the vampire firefly or the, uh, the femme fatale, they call it. Uh, so, so all fire, well, not all, but all fireflies of the genus Photinus contain a toxic steroid called lucibifagans. So this is, this is why uh, bats, toads, birds, mice, they all show an aversion reflex to fireflies. They taste bad. But there is a kind of firefly, a lar the larger firefly called Photurus, uh, that's the genus. Um, they, for some, for whatever reason, do not have this toxic steroid. And so in order to acquire that toxic steroid to um, help with her defenses, she eats a couple male Photinus fireflies each night. And the way she does this, she's a very, she becomes a very sophisticated predator and uses her lantern as a deception. So she can imitate the specific flash pattern of the Photinus fireflies to draw him in. So he comes in thinking that he's going to get the female of his species and instead he gets eaten by the female Photorus. So she does this um, maybe a few times a night. Uh, she can either catch the little, the smaller Photinus on the wing. She can, she can even steal these guys from uh, uh, spider webs or she can sit perched and lure them in with her with her deception. So it is a dog eat dog world out there. You, what we think is this, this sort of peaceful light show, there's, there's a lot more going on uh, as with a lot of nature once you, once you look into it a little more. So fireflies, there are many threats today. As we mentioned insects in general, we mentioned this in a previous uh, class. Insects in general are declining. Uh, fireflies in particular, um, these three main threats, so habitat loss. Remember we mentioned there are 48 million acres of lawn in the U.S. and on some of those lawns we're using more pesticides per acre than some agricultural areas. So pesticides are going to directly obviously affect uh, the survivorship of this insect and also can affect the survivorship of their prey. So anything like herbicides that affect earthworms that, that the larvae eat, that the larval fireflies eat, are going to be a detriment to the uh, population growth of fireflies. Uh, so habitat loss also can include um, any disturbance, a lot of disturbance to the soil or stream banks where they may uh, lay their eggs. Uh, and also these fireflies are, are pretty local, so they have very low dispersal ability. So the adult may emerge really just a few meters away from where the egg was laid, and then they don't really disperse a lot. They sort of hang out in the meadow where the, where the courtship happened and where they hatched. So local population extinctions are very common with this, species, this uh, organism. So, and then of course, light pollution is a problem because it interferes with their bioluminescent communication. So they did uh, experiments with uh, to, uh, one of the Northern European glowworms and found that a glowworm, a female glowworm who had set up shop underneath a street lamp, obviously mated less than one who set up shop in a dark area. So interference with communication. And as we know from satellite imagery, uh, we Earth has lost a lot of our darkness. And so this, you know, we have to remember is at the expense of other organisms. So some things that you can do to create inviting firefly habitat is uh, one is mow less. So when you mow less, then you have more areas, of course, staging areas for them. Remember the females perch on the blade of grass and this is where where mating occurs as well so fireflies like uh, you know suburban lawn roadsides meadows that's where they display that's where the mating the mating occurs and the egg laying 
Um, and so the less you mow, the more natural it is, the healthier and more moist the soil is. And then of course, leaving leaf litter and woody debris is important for uh, the egg laying, leaving moist areas like mossy banks. Um, all of this can help fireflies. Uh, minimizing light pollution, of course. Um, we tend to, many suburban neighborhoods now tend to kind of light up the night and light up the houses with, with, uh, with lights. So trying to minimize that light pollution, you use, using only the lowest wattage possible and maybe putting them on timers and only using what you need, making sure your lights are aimed down using shielded light fixtures, uh, all of this can help. And of course, reducing pesticides is always a suggestion. So avoiding those broad spectrum pesticides, you're trying to use organic products, uh, maybe only using when you have a problem instead of this sort of just general, just in case spraying, which may not be necessary. Um, and then I also mentioned avoiding herbicides. So even herbicides, which aren't directly killing the, the fireflies, they kill things like the earthworms, which they eat with, which the fireflies eat in the larval stage. So here are some, uh, some resources. We've got Firefly Watch, which is a great, if you wanna go out with your grandkids uh, and watch the fireflies at night, you can actually go to Firefly Watch. Uh, you can see in the upper left here, they give you uh, flash patterns of the different ones that you can see in your area and you can sit and monitor which ones you think you're seeing. That's a good citizen science project out of Mass Audubon. Um, and then silentsparks.com is a, is a great resource to learn more about fireflies. She's the one who wrote uh, one of the only books I know of about fireflies called Silent Sparks, it's Sarah Lewis. And then these are just some wonderful little, maybe Christmas ideas for grandchildren or uh, Sam the Firefly, the Very Lonely Firefly, all classic, classic books about fireflies. So this is just a little, if you go out, in the night and capture these guys in bug boxes, the way you identify species and sex is uh, you would turn them over and look at their lanterns. So on the left is the female Photorus, it's that larger firefly. You can see her lantern only takes up part of those, those back segments of the abdomen. And then a male of the Photinus is pictured on the right. And he just has two of the last three segments um, associated with his lantern. And then hopefully this will play for you. This is just a really beautiful video that somebody made about a summer night with fireflies that I've wanted you guys to all experience. I'll play that here.
things. The beautiful things you can find on YouTube. I love that video. It's fun to think about a summer night when it's November, right? <laughs> so then the other uh, enchanting organisms that uh, fill our night skies are moths, which you can uh, discover at night using. We, we've done, we had a great uh, program this past summer with the Academy of Natural Sciences who came and brought their entomologists and uh, all their different special lights. So the way, now this sheet is a picture I got offline of, I think this is in some tropical area. If you put up a, a sheet and did light trapping in Pennsylvania, I don't think you would get that many different moths anywhere, unless maybe you were out um, Ohio, they've got a what's called a mothapalooza that you can go to and they have a lot of different species out there. Of course, the more darkness that you have, the more rural it is, the better, uh, because again, light pollution uh, has, uh, has uh, contributed to the decline of a lot of moths around here. Uh, but light trapping is a great way. You can even just turn on a porch light and see what kind of species uh, may come to your light if you don't have special lights. Uh, so then this butterflies and moths of North America, I'll show you that at the end. Uh, we could stop my screen sharing and show you, but that's another great citizen science uh, program, a citizen science resource. So you can report uh, any butterflies and moths that you see. Uh, and moths in particular, uh, citizen science is important because they know a lot about butterflies. So there's over 800 species of butterflies in North America, and there's something like 12,000 species of moths. So there's a, uh, so 800 species of butterflies, 12,000 species of moths. So that's quite a uh, differenti differential. So uh, and there's a lot they don't know about moths, of course, because they're, they're nocturnal. So uh, citizen science can really help locate uh, and identify your moth populations. And you may just think of, you know, those little obnoxious white moths that fly around your house and eat your clothes. But, you know, with 12,000 species, there's, there's quite a diversity and some of them are incredibly beautiful, maybe more so than some butterflies. Uh, so we have uh, uh, silk moth, that's a, a family that contains really some of the most beautiful moths. They can be mistaken for bats at night. So on the left is our largest moth in North America, the Cecropia moth, just beautiful, beautiful coloring. They appear soft. They're covered in specialized scales that give moths that sort of soft velvety appearance. And then on the right, we have the tulip tree silk moth. Uh, so just beautiful. And again, just like the fireflies, many of these moths that you may see, you're just seeing that really the, the last short leg of their life. And they would have been uh, caterpillars for, for much longer uh, feasting on their particular host plant. Io moth, that's another beautiful uh, one of our, our silk moths. I uh, got to see one of those in a porch light in central Pennsylvania. I haven't seen one since, but they're beautiful. They open their wings and of course, they're mimicking uh, the eyes of an owl to help uh, ward off predators who may want to eat them. So moths are an important part of the ecosystem. They are they're pollinators. They're really the night shift of our pollinator industry. And with that many species, uh, you can you can tell they would do they do a lot of work that the butterflies can't do in pollination. They are food web drivers. We mentioned in previous talks for this class how important caterpillars are uh, for the food web and for supporting population growth of birds because over 90% of our land birds do feed their young caterpillars or if they can get the caterpillars, they really hone in on that. Because so remember, they're just these juicy um, packets of protein that don't require any preparation, just shove it in the baby's mouth. It's easy to digest and a great source of nutrients. So, and moths are also indicator species. So, you know, if there is a moth, certain moth species in an area uh, one year and gone in the next decade, that could uh, signal a problem, of pollution or habitat loss or, or something else. So moths are, have all kinds of cool um, characteristics, adaptations. Some of them like uh, the tiger moth can actually deflect a bat. So bats love eating moths, of course. 
um, this type of moth can actually deflect a bat's uh, echolocation, uh, kind of jam, jam those waves so the bat can't locate them. We've got sphinx or hawk moths. This is, these are some of our fastest flying insects. Uh, these are the ones that are related to that hummingbird clear wing moth you may have seen in your garden in the summertime that you might have mistaken for a hummingbird. They hover just like a hummingbird and they are diurnal rather than nocturnal like most of our other moths. That's the hummingbird clear wing moth drinking from uh, milkweed. And then they just come in this huge array. You know, this one looks like a rolled up leaf, just in incredible diversity. And of course, the maybe the most famous of moths is the, the beautiful Luna moth that really only lives for a week uh, in, in June, uh, late June. Uh, they only fly for about a week. And again, this complete metamorphosis. So the young of the Luna moth eats, 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 and then the adult doesn't even have mouth parts. Uh, so their primary role of the adult is sex. The primary role of the juvenile is to eat and grow. Uh, and so then this, these, this is another one of our silk moths. So they just really, after mating, they fly around and scatter their eggs in various places in the forest under leaves, and then they die and then the eggs are left to develop. Uh, and the Luna moth in our region specializes on uh, sweet gum. So that's the uh, beautiful tree now that's, well, maybe most of the leaves are off now, but it turns this beautiful orangey red, red, uh, orange, and the star-shaped leaves with the gumballs you might know of. Uh, so that's the host plant for the Luna moth in our region. And then further north, their host plant is, are things like uh, paper birches. So again, remembering that moths are uh, host plant specialists, so they need native plants. Uh, we drove that point home a lot in a previous class, but it can't stress the importance of natives for rebuilding food webs, um, bringing back insects, bringing back birds, and really supporting all of life. So native plants, as much as you can, minimize pesticides, of course, minimize light pollution. Because again, just like the fireflies, moths are also affected by light pollution because not because of their courtship, but because they waste time being attracted to these lights when they should be mating in that you know very short window of time that they have as adults. And then of course, leaving the leaf litter because um, with all those different species of moths, they, they make their cocoons, pupate and have their cocoons in a variety of places, some of which are in the leaf litter. So, you know, in the fall when people are blowing leaves, sometimes it's good if you can, you know, if you have beds and islands of plants, if you just leave some of those leaves in there, uh, can really be beneficial to insects like moths. And then here is, I mentioned this to you at a previous class, this new, really huge citizen science project and this uh, attempt to create this new, what, what Doug Tallamy calls homegrown national park of 20 million acres of native habitat. If everybody just designates part of their uh, sort of lawn habitat to native habitat, uh, he believes that we can really start to rebuild food webs and bring back insects and birds. And I thought it was so cool when I went there and uh, looked into it more that uh, their, their symbol is a firefly. <laughs> so it fits nicely. Before I talk.